From the Pier 4 Pier Ministerial Association is Pastor Craig Wexler, and I guess leading us in the Pledge of Allegiance is me. Need I remind us that we scheduled this during Holy Week, <clears throat> so you all owe me an Easter sermon. <laughs> the Lord be with you. And also with you. Gracious God. We come before you today under very different circumstances than we gather for most of the times. Most of the time here, Lord, we come together listening to our constituents and crafting law, bringing it to the table and hashing it out and striving to better serve our neighbors today, Lord, though we are part of enacting law. And Lord, I just ask you to give us wisdom. Give us wisdom with our words, give us wisdom with our thoughts. And as we do remember that this week is Holy Week, we, all of us, whether we believe it or not, are on our own journeys towards that cross. And that cross of Christ crucified is what reminds us that no matter what happens in this time and in this way, that death is not the final answer. And that no matter what we do and whatever we enact in this life, you are the one that gives us grace and mercy. For all of this, we lift all of this into your name we pray. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Madam Clerk, please call the Representatives Anderson, Albert, Bartles, Barthel, Bill, Blair, yeah. Bargo, Chafee, Chase, Schwab, Davis, Dennett, Derby, Deutsch, Drury, Duba, Fink, Fitzgerald, Goodwin, Greenfield, Lana, Gross, Hansen, Haugard, Healy, Hoffman, Howard, Jameson, Jensen, Kevin, Jensen, Phil, Johnson, Chris, Carr, Kynes, Koth, Ladner, Lesmeister, Marty, May, Mills, Milstead, Miss Gimmons, Mortensen, Mullally, Odenbach, Olson, Otten, Ernie, Overwig, Perry, Peterson, Kent, Peterson, Sue, Sheehy, Smith, Jamie, Soy, St. John, Stevens, Thomas, yeah. Tiedemann, Vascard, Weiss, Weisgram, Weesey, Willitson, Wink, yeah. York, Speaker Gosh. Yeah. Mr. Speaker, there is a quorum. We have a quorum. Approval of the journal. Mr. Speaker, the Committee on Legislative Procedure respectfully reports that the Chief Clerk of the House has had under consideration the House Journal of the first day. All errors, typographical or otherwise, are duly marked in the temporary journal for correction, and we hereby move the adoption of the report respectfully submitted. Spencer Gosh, Chair. Second. That motion having been made and seconded, all those in favor say aye. Aye. All those opposed nay. <laughs> Communications. Representative Scott Odenbach informed Speaker Gosh on April 6, 2022, that he would be recusing himself from today's proceedings. Reports of standing committees. In the matter of the investigation of the conduct of Jason Roundsburg, Attorney General of the State of South Dakota, South Dakota, the House Select Committee's majority report and recommendations were submitted to the Chief Clerk on March 29, 2002. Copies were distributed to all representatives. In the matter of the investigation of the conduct of Jason Roundsburg, Attorney General of the State of South Dakota, House Select Committee's minority report and recommendations was submitted to the Chief Clerk on March 29, 2002. Copies were distributed to all representatives. First reading of House Bills. House Resolution 7002, a resolution providing for the impeachment of Jason Roundsburg, Attorney General of the State of South Dakota, for certain crimes and malfeasance in office. Representative Mortensen moved that House Res Resolution 7002 
be placed on the calendar for immediate consideration pursuant to special rule number five. Second. That motion having been made, second, a discussion on your motion to calendar. Representative Lawrence. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Members of the body, uh, I will be very brief. We all know uh, what brings us here today. Uh, I will not be lengthy in, in asking you to support this calendaring motion, but instead we should move forward to the debate uh, ahead of us. So please vote green. Any remarks in the motion to calendar? Hearing no further remarks, the question for the body is to calendar HR 7002 on today's calendar. All those in favor will vote yay. Those opposed nay. Madam Clerk, please unlock the voting machine with the members proceed to vote. Representative Goodwin, Representative Phil Jensen. Mr. Speaker, all members have voted. Please display the vote. Mr. Speaker, there were ayes 51, nays 16, excused 3. Motion to place HR 7002 at, on today's calendar, having received an affirmative vote of the members elect, hereby declared passed. Second reading, House Bills and Joint Resolutions. House Resolution 7002, a resolution providing for the impeachment of Jason Roundsburg, Attorney General of the State of South Dakota, for certain crimes and for malfeasance in office. House Resolution 7002, having had its second reading, is now for consideration of final passage of the remarks. Representative Mortensen. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, members of the body. We find ourselves today in a great and exceptional situation. The Attorney General has broken the law, and as a result of that, one of our citizens has died. Our top law enforcement officer has misled law enforcement during the investigation of those crimes. Never before in our state's history has it been that a state official criminally ended the life of one of our citizens and refused to resign from that post? This is a grave and exceptional situation. But that's not the question before the House. The question before the House is, is the Attorney General's conduct impeachable? How do we know? Article 16, Section 3 includes a very short and very broadly defined uh, set of terms. Drunkenness, crimes, corrupt conduct, malfeasance or misdemeanor in office. Which crimes? What type of corrupt conduct are we talking about? The question of impeachment is not a math question. We are not taking two discrete inputs and getting one output. Doesn't work that way. It'd be easy if it did, but it's not. This is a tough decision before each and every one of us. The framers of the Constitution instead vested this body with the sole power of impeachment. They gave us broad discretion, and it is within our sound discretion to say what is impeachable, and in this case, whether Mr. Roundsburg's actions rise to that level. It's a duty we must not take lightly. I have a lot of reverence for this institution and for this house. I think a lot about its past, and I think a lot about its future. It is undeniable that there is a precedent being set today. I want everybody to understand that before we vote on this. What we do affects not only today, and not only the folks involved, it will affect folks in the future. Something we cannot take lightly. I believe impeachment should be reserved only for grave and exceptional circumstances. 
and I believe this is one. How do we know? I submit we ex uh, exercise our judgment, we exercise our discretion by looking at the facts, the circumstances, and the results of the crimes of Jason Roundsburg. I posit to you today that the conduct merits impeachment in this House and a trial in the Senate on whether or not he should be removed from office. I'm going to spend my next couple minutes talking about Article 1 and expounding on that article of impeachment. I'll defer to the good representative from Yankton to talk about Article 2. Article 1, crimes causing the death of Joseph Beaver. It rests on firmly established facts. The facts underpinning the crimes of Jason Roundsburg have been extensively reviewed. I applaud the efforts of law enforcement in gathering and analyzing the evidence. I applaud the efforts of the Select Committee in poking, prodding, and looking for holes in that analysis. Because of the efforts of law enforcement and the efforts of the Select Committee, I think there is no room left for doubt in the following facts. The Attorney General left his lane before striking Joseph Beaver. Now, how do we know that? I believe it was well demonstrated by seasoned, experienced investigators using professional and commendable practices. We trust law enforcement. They say he had left his lane. The fact has been admitted by the Attorney General, who pled guilty to driving outside of his lane and was found guilty as such of a court. Now, I know that there might be some open question as to how far outside the lane. I know that there have been claims one way or the other, but I do not believe there is a serious claim that he was inside the, the roadway, inside the lane. Again, I think it is well established the Attorney General left his lane before striking Joe Beaver. Why is that important? Joe Beaver was standing where he had every right to be, doing what he had every right to be doing. He was walking home. The second fact is the Attorney General was distracted from the road when he hit Joseph Beaver. The Attorney General claimed in no uncertain terms that he did not see the pedestrian before hitting him. I take him at his word. The Attorney General claimed under no uncertain terms he did not know what he had hit after running into Joe Beaver. We know Joe Beaver was carrying a limited flashlight. And so the fact is if he were looking, if he were not distracted, he would have seen the man. If you think he saw the man and that he was paying attention and that he was not distracted, then we're talking about a far more serious crime. I'm not alleging that crime at this time. I'm merely saying his attention was not where it had ought to have been on the road. Finally, Mr. Roundsburg was convicted of two crimes and found guilty in a court of law. Again, I think all those facts about the crimes rest on well-established grounds. So what about the circumstances? The circumstances in this case show to me a troubling pattern of behavior and not an isolated incident. Every single person who has ever operated a motor vehicle has broken a traffic law. I think that's true. I don't know that it's true, but I bet that's true. Very few, however, have been stopped more than two dozen times and cited repeatedly for unsafe driving. The reason for our traffic laws is the safety of others. The punishment for one-off offenses is not severe because the relative risk of one incident is not high. However, if somebody travels unsafely regularly enough, eventually someone's going to be harmed. In this case, the Attorney General showed repeated disregard for the safety of others. Despite being caught by law enforcement repeatedly, he did not change that behavior. This pattern of behavior is a circumstance that to me raises the gravity of the crime. Another disturbing pattern relates to the Attorney General's repeated use of his office and his title in encounters with law enforcement. While it's not for us to say why the Attorney General tells law enforcement about his office, I think we should all agree that it is a disturbing pattern and one we saw on the night of, uh, of this encounter. These circumstances which were on display that night uh, are exceptional. They inform and perhaps contribute to the crimes that Mr. Roundsburg has committed. Finally, we need to look at the results of the crimes, the facts of the crimes, the circumstances of the crimes, and the results of these crimes. We would not be here on this floor if one of our citizens had not died. That fact is the most grave, the most exceptional. Never before in our state's history has a state official criminally caused the death of a citizen and remained in office without resigning. But that is the direct result of the crimes 
the Attorney General is committed. If these were just traffic tickets, we wouldn't be here. No one thinks we would. If we were looking only at one factor here, and it was the crime convicted of, we wouldn't be here. But that's not what this House is called to do. Claiming that these are just two, class two misdemeanors is forgetting one person. An additional result of the crimes of the Attorney General is the loss of faith the Attorney General is supposed to serve. In our state, the Attorney General has two primary jobs, being the top law enforcement officer, serving and supporting law enforcement, and being the attorney for the executive branch or state government. We have heard from both, publicly and privately, that they are not being served and not supported. They do not trust the Attorney General. They believe he should be removed. Our duty is triggered when our state is not served. The reason we have the power of impeachment is to protect the public when impeachable offenses have occurred and the state is being harmed. That is the case today. The crimes of Joe Beaver committed are impeachable under our Constitution. The, crimes of, the facts have been well established. The circumstances show a troubling pattern of behavior and the results are not tenable. With the death of one of our citizens and harm to our criminal justice system statewide. No one element is dispositive. This isn't math. This is in our sound discretion. We need to look at the facts. We need to look at the circumstances. And we need to look at the results. I'm asking you to support this resolution and send the matter to the Senate for a full trial. Mr. Speaker. For the remarks, Representative Shaw. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. <coughs> Fellow representatives, um, I ask you to join me in, in concluding that the Attorney General committed malfeasance in office that warrants a trial uh, for consideration of his removal in the Senate. Um, I reached this conclusion myself for three reasons. The Attorney General's September 14th, 2020 press release. The Attorney General's interactions with South Dakota DCI agent Gromer. And the testimony of law enforcement concerning the Attorney General's answers and behaviors during their interrogations. I passed out documents on each of your desks um, together, let's review the Attorney General's press release, which is marked as Exhibit A. First, I want to point out that this uh, is on the Attorney General's official letterhead. Uh, the majority report of the Select Committee concluded that the AG was not in office at the time. But less than 25 seconds after the crash, crash he calls himself the AG. And still, less than 48 hours after Mr. Beaver's death, the AG is using his official letterhead to explain himself. Regardless of our station in life, we all have a duty of honesty and fair dealing towards each other. But this duty is certainly heightened when placed in a position of public trust. It's heightened for us, it's heightened for the Attorney General. In this letter, the Attorney General states he is providing the public a full and factual account in the first paragraph. We now know that this is not true. In the second paragraph, the Attorney General states that his vehicle struck something that I believe to be a large animal, likely a deer. Later, in paragraph three, he states, at no time did I suspect I had been in an accident with a person. But to the dispatcher, the AG refuses to confirm that he hit a deer when asked. When asked if he hit a deer or something, the AG responds, I have no idea, and that transcript is Exhibit B, and that exchange is on, on page two. Now, this is an important question for the dispatcher to get a truthful answer. In particular, it allows the dispatcher to determine if, among other things, an ambulance needs to be sent to the scene. In his text conversations with Tim Borman and David Natviv, Mr. Borman says, oh, explicit exp that, ah, curse word, uh, did the deer die instantly? And this is Exhibit C, this exchange. The Attorney General responds, I hit something in the road. And later says, still not sure what fully happened as I was driving along. Now, I do not know that he knew he hit a person at that time, but he definitely did not believe he hit a deer based on his text messages. Throughout the letter, uh, he's Exhibit A, he states that the accident occurred on the road or roadway. We now know this is not true. And the Attorney General pled no contest to a lane violation charge. I also find this press release completely inappropriate. At the time he released it, he had not been fully interrogated by investigators. 
as our state's top law enforcement officer, he more than anyone else should know that such a statement to the public during a pending investigation is inappropriate. The Attorney General also abused his position. On September 15th, 2020, less than 72 hours after he struck Mr. Beaver, the Attorney General questioned a South Dakota staff member on how the North Dakota investigators would access information in the Attorney General's phone. In our committee hearings, uh, DCI Director Natvey described this as a passing conversation in the hallway that concluded in his office. But Agent Gromer in Exhibit D was so disturbed by the conversation, which actually occurred in Director Natvey's office, who is ultimately Mr. Gromer's top supervisor, that he felt he needed to document it, which is Exhibit E, excuse me. This conversation did not occur in the hallway. The AG sought him out and brought him to uh, Director Natvig's office. Mr. Gromer's account of the meeting, written shortly after the meeting occurred, shows the Attorney General's effort to learn about how the case against him could be made. He asks questions and receives detailed answers about what information will be pulled from his phones. He asks specific questions about emails, cell phone flashlights, and other items that we know end up being pretty important in the investigation. Here, too, the Attorney General lies to Mr. Gromer. He says that he only used his phone to call his dad, when we now know that he was on his phone for 69% of the drive, including a little over one minute before the accident. The Attorney General used the privileges of his office to learn about how the investigation would be conducted. The average suspect would not be able to learn the techniques of those investigating him, and I submit to you that that is wrong, that that is malfeasance, that he had a duty to completely wall himself from the investigation, including the people in his office. But for me, the most important piece of evidence of the entire select committee was the testimony of, of North Dakota BCI agents Rummel and Arns. I found their opinions and conclusions to be reliable, sincere, and credible based upon their experience and expertise as law enforcement officers. They told the select committee that the Attorney General was not being truthful to them in the interrogations. During the second interrogation, the Attorney General is asked several times about his cell phone use. He does not remember using his cell phone to tax or access data. He says this several times. Of course, approximately one minute before the crash, slightly over, he was on the phone reading news articles and checking his emails. It was not until the interrogators told him they knew about his phone use that he acknowledged using it. On your desk is Exhibit F, um, which shows the evolution of the AG's attempt to deny his cell phone use until he ultimately admits it from that interrogation. Mr. Arms testified under oath that the Attorney General made statements during the interrogation that indicated the Attorney General knew at the time of the accident that he did not hit a deer. This is consistent with the Attorney General's own private statements discussed above at the time of the accident. <coughs> Agent Rummel noted that the Attorney General would slam his hands down and get emphatic after he made a mistake. He also testified that the Attorney General was extremely uncomfortable throughout the interrogation. And in his experience, witnesses typically exhibit this behavior when they know they are not being truthful. Agent Rummel also testified that the Attorney General's recollection was too inconsistent with the facts to be believable. Mr. Beaver lied naked off the shoulder with no color to him. Cell phone records indicate the AG walked by Mr. Beaver's body when he either reported the crash or was looking in, when he, in the ditch with his cell phone flashlight. Agent Rummel testified that it would have been impossible not to see Mr. Beaver's dead body under those circumstances. As the Attorney General, Jason Roundsburg had a unique and special duty to fully cooperate in the investigation of the fatal crash. The record indicates, however, that he was less than forthcoming and perhaps even lied during his interview with law, law enforcement officers completing the investigation. 
based on the totality of the circumstances, I believe it's reasonable to conclude that the criminal act which led to Mr. Beaver's death, albeit a class two misdemeanor, and his subsequent actions are grounds for the Attorney General's impeachment under Article 16, Section 3. Thank you. Further remarks, Representative Dunch. <coughs> Mr. Speaker, I have an amendment. Has it been distributed? It has, online. And you'd like to move it at this time? I would. Okay. Motion having been made and seconded, discussion on the motion. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, I agree that we are here on a very grave and exceptional matter. An important matter. Um, my amendment removes the second article of impeachment on malfeasance, which, in my humble opinion, is an exaggeration. Um, when I read through the two articles and come to the section on malfeasance, I think to myself, would this body even be here if the first article did not exist? If this terrible, tragic accident that took the life of a, of a human being, a South Dakota citizen, did not occur? Let's say he truly, the Attorney General truly did hit a deer. Would we even be here? Would we be making a vote today on the second article relating to malfeasance. And I would, again, humbly suggest to you that we would not be here. In my opinion, this body should take a vote on what's truly a grave and exceptional circumstance, an important circumstance, and that was the collision and crash and death of a South Dakota citizen as outlined in the first article of impeachment. And I would again suggest to you that we should vote green on the amendment and let's move forward discussing what's really truly and clearly uh, an issue in South Dakota. Thank you. Any remarks on the motion to amend? remarks. Hearing no further remarks, this requires a simple majority of the members present. There being no objection, the speaker will call roll call immediately. The question before the body is to suspend House Resolution set, or to amend, sorry, House Resolution 7002 7002A. All those in favor will vote yay. Those opposed nay. Madam Clerk, please unlock the voting machine with the members for certificate. Representative Schneider. Mr. Speaker, all members have voted. Please display the vote. Mr. Speaker, there were ayes 19, nays 48, excused 3. The motion fails. <laughs> we're back to 7002 as in its original form of hearing remarks. Representative Fitzgerald. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The tragic circumstances surrounding the death of Mr. Joe Bevere on the evening of September 12, 2020 have resulted in a lack of confidence in the Attorney General to effectively carry out his duties as the Chief Law Enforcement Officer in South Dakota. Character, truthfulness, honesty, and preserving the rule of law are essential to the role of the Chief Law Enforcement Officer in the state of South Dakota. The actions of the Attorney General have misguided the people of South Dakota into thinking there are two tiers of justice, one for the powerful politicians and one for the average citizen. This has affected the public's trust in the justice system and has demonstrated that the ones with power 
remain in power. This is not right. The evidence presented before the committee, the public, and to the House have demonstrated attorney, the Attorney General is not fit to carry out his role as the Chief Law Enforcement Officer of South Dakota. Countless times the AG abused his power and position. Countless times he showed a lack of respect for the law and for the men and women who stand behind the thin blue line. The South Dakota Fraternal Order of Police, the South Dakota Chiefs of Police Association, and the South Dakota Sheriff's Association have asked for the AG to resign. The Attorney General must be held accountable for his actions. His conduct while in office and the inherent lack of trust that the people of South Dakota have for the Attorney General. This is not about how this has changed his life forever, but to move on, instill trust back in the people who follow the law. South Dakota deserves better. I would ask that you support HR 7002. Thank you. Any remarks? Any remarks? Representative Goodman. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Well, I got a confession to make. I've been driving for 50 years since I had my driver's license, and I've hit six deer. The reason I can remember is I thought back to all the vehicles and the damage that was done to them. But I never did dial 911. Of course, early on, we didn't have the capability to dial 911. We'd have to go find a payphone to do that, but recently we could. And so, why would somebody dial 911 if they hit a deer? I think members of this body have hit a deer. Did you call 911? No, you'd call 911 if you hit a body. Of course you would. I think that's a big point. Now this notion about being in office, now was he on official duty as the Attorney General? I think that's what we're saying. Our committee said that they didn't think he was. Well, I say to you, law enforcement is on duty 24 hours a day. Ask any of your sheriffs, ask any of your policemen, anyone in law enforcement, you get a call at two in the morning, four in the morning, and he has to go do duty. If you talk to most law enforcement, I know the sheriffs I know, they're very careful that they don't drink more than one or two drinks because they might get called up. They're on duty. This is the number one law enforcement officer in our state. And we're using the clause that he wasn't on duty when he, as the attorney general. He was on, he's on duty every day. The people voted him in to be on duty every day. The citizens did. They think he's on duty every day. Ask any citizen. You think the attorney's on, on duty at midnight? They're gonna say yes. They're gonna say, no, it's not, it's a nine to five job. They're not gonna say that. So, and I also think that the Attorney General thought he was on duty. Because the first thing he did that we've already talked about, and he reiterated this, is that he was the Adjutant General, or Adjutant, excuse me, I got my guard stuck in my head. The Attorney General. Well, why would you say that if you weren't on duty? Also, if you weren't on duty, why wouldn't you use your personal cell phone instead of your government cell phone? Using the government cell phone proves he's on duty. He could have used his personal cell phone. He had it with him. Also, all the other minor fractions he had that you've read about, like 27, usually in most of those, he flashed his badge. He said he was the Attorney General. Some of me was on his way to uh, drill for the U.S. Army Reserve. Everybody said he was in the National Guard. He was in the Army Reserve. There's a difference. In Omaha. Of course, if he was in the National Guard, he wouldn't go out of state for drill. And he even got picked up in a, in a state vehicle going to National Guard drill. Now, that's not what we're talking about here, but I don't know how many times he took that state vehicle because he got picked up in it. And if you're gonna take, some, if you're gonna take a state vehicle unauthorized, you probably wouldn't speed. And when he did get picked up, what did he say? He showed his badge and said he was the Attorney General. So he even thinks he's on duty when he's going to drill for the uh, Army Reserve. So I think it's crystal clear that the Attorney General is on duty 24 hours a day. I don't think any of the citizens that are listening to this would disagree with that. Now, I'm not disrespecting the committee. In fact, I feel sorry for the select committee because we had a grueling session. I mean, it was grueling. We had all this federal money that we were forced on us and we had to spend it wisely and it was, it was a tough session. And then to pig pile on top of that, 
those people met like 10 times. I know sometimes they went for four hours. I mean, on veto day, I felt sorry for them. They had to go in to a uh, committee session right after we got on veto day, and they were in there for four hours. I mean, I am not second guessing their decision. I'm just saying that the decision is wrong. The Attorney General was on duty that night when he struck and killed Joe Beaver. The other notion is that maybe he wasn't, uh, he was going down the middle, he was going down the middle of the road when he hit Joe Beaver. Well, he already, he, he pled guilty that he, was off, that he was off the side of the road. He already, he pled guilty to that. So the notion that, that Joe Beaver was in the middle of the road is not true because he pled guilty to that. Why would he do that if he wasn't? He was on the shoulder of the road. He went over the rumble stick. The other thing he pled guilty was for using a cell phone while driving. So if you're using a cell phone while driving, and you're, run, and you're running, and you go across the rumble strip, both the white lines on the left side of your car, you're totally on the shoulder of the road, you're going 68 miles an hour, and you hit and kill an individual, do you think you should still be the Attorney General? And do you think he wasn't in office at that time? I say that he is. Now, we're not deciding anything here as far as if he's removed or not. And we could argue if this is a grand jury or not. We kind of had a debate on that earlier. What we're deciding to do is if we're going to impeach the Attorney General, which is, you know, very obvious if you look at it from the way I just ex explained it, he was on duty, and then have the Senate have the trial. In correspondence that the Attorney General Off sent us, thank you. In, the, in correspondence the Attorney sent, General sent us, he said he wished he could have had a trial uh, with a jury when he was sentenced in the, civil, in the civilian court, the civil court, I believe you call it. And because he didn't, he pled guilty. Well, we have a chance today to give him his trial. All we have to do is send it over to the Senate, and they'll have a trial. I think they have to wait 20 days, and they'll probably get through the primary, and after the primary, they'll have a trial over in the Senate, and he'll have a chance to bring all his evidence. It'll be a fair trial, and they're gonna decide if he stays in office. We're not gonna decide. We're just deciding if this is warranted that it should go to trial. And the decision you have to decide is the Attorney General on duty 24 hours a day, or is he not? I say to you, ladies and gentlemen, the Attorney General, like law, all law enforcement, is on duty 24 hours a day. Thank you very much. Further remarks? Representative Young. Yes, Representative York. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Friends in the House, this is a very sad day for me. <clears throat> this will be the last time that I will push a vote button as a member of the South Dakota House of Representatives. This case has so many, many layers, as you've all heard. You all have personal opinions. But the main one to me is how the legislative body of this state treats our citizens. We're all equal, and we must be treated as such. In a time when our law enforcement is so under fire, we need to respect those folks that put their lives on the line every day for us. They have lost the respect now for their attorney general, their boss. Earlier today, someone said, sunlight is the best disinfectant in the world. I believe today is the day we show some sunlight on this case and on all the leaders of the state of South Dakota. In respect for the state of South Dakota, I will be supporting the resolution. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. You know, it seems to be that some people think that if we impeach the Attorney General, we won't have one. Remember, even if he is impeached and he goes through the trial in the Senate and is found guilty, we will still have an Attorney General. It just won't be Mr. Rahm. But that's kind of the temperament of some people I talk to is, oh, if we get rid of him, what's going to happen? We will have another one, folks. Number two, I had a message brought to me this morning that uh, from Mrs. Beaver that the Attorney General has never apologized to her. That was given to me this morning directly from her. And she's sitting right up in the back up there. So anybody that says he's apologized, no, he has not. That came straight from her. The third thing I'll say and end this for me is if you're looking down, adjusting radio, 
messing with your phone, cruise control, your eyes are off the road, and you run off the road and hit somebody, you're saying it's not distracted driving. Does that mean he was at 10 and 2 looking through the windshield when he hit this individual? It's pretty simple to me. He was either distracted or not. So either he was distracted driving, which is an impeachable offense, or he was not. And I think it was stated earlier, that means there should be some other very harsh charges brought. Thank you. Further remarks? Further remarks? Representative Doolin. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. It's a tough day, and I want to thank the, rep the good representative from Hughes County and from um, Yankton County for, for speaking out on the articles. And all of you, we, we've all got to make a tough decision today. I took the time to read every piece of evidence, listen to every interview, watch the videos again. And then last night at 9.42 p.m., we get a letter from the Attorney General. We get a letter at 9.42 p.m. And he said, I'm trying to respect the process. He'd had the opportunity because the special committee invited him. He had the opportunity to come and testify under oath. And he did not do that. Now, we don't know why he didn't do it. But at the 11th hour, he sends us a letter. There were many errors in that letter if you took the time to read it. So obviously, it was either hastily put together, he didn't quality check it, or whatever the case may be. But I was offended by the letter. There were statements in there that were shocking to me. But the one that stuck with me the most was where he said, and I quote, let me get to it, it's the conclusion. Apologize. It has been 576 days since the accident. I mark it on my calendar each day and reflect. I want to say I'm sorry. Every day I think about Joe Beaver, a man I had never met who changed my life forever. Well, let's turn that around. You took Joe Beaver's life. Did you intend to hit him? No, but you did. And that's what we're about today, and that's what we need to think about when we push the button. Thank you. Further remarks? Further remarks? Hearing no further remarks, there really isn't any opposition testimony. Do you want a rebuttal? Very briefly, Mr. Speaker. Close this up. You bet. Uh, every single person is in this room because we've been elected by constituents by voters by the people of South Dakota. And these positions of public trust are a privilege and not a right. What we are talking today is not about taking away Mr. Be or Mr. Roundsbury's rights. We're not talking about putting him in jail. We're talking about whether, as a result of his crimes and his malfeasance in office, he's violated his duty to the people of South Dakota. I think he has. And when that duty is violated, it triggers our duty as the House of Representatives under our Constitution. Not to remove him from office, that's not our job. We are the sole in power of, of impeachment. We have the sole power of impeachment. But from here, it goes to the Senate. You vote green today, it goes to the Senate for a full trial, and he can't be removed unless by a two-thirds majority of that body they find these facts to be true and these actions to be impeached. It's a privilege given to us by the people. We've got a duty we owe to the people. Please bless me. Question for the body is final passage of House Resolution 7002. All those in favor will vote yay. Those opposed nay. Madam Clerk, please unlock the voting machine with the members to proceed to vote. Representative Perry, Representative Pishtu, okay. 
Mr. Speaker, all members have voted. Please display the vote. Mr. Speaker, there were ayes 36, nays 31, excuse 3. House Resolution 7002, having received an affirmative vote of the members elect, is hereby declared passed. <coughs> Any questions on the title? Hearing none, the title is deemed correct. Representative Brown. We've got to wait to sign the resolution, so we're going to hold off the moment you are excused. You may leave, but we're going to wait to adjourn to sign it in open session. So if we could just wait just a moment. Thank you.